You're tuned to the ebook Revolution. Once again, I'm Jeff Hughes from Madhouse Media, and you're tuned into the podcast where we talk about writing, independent publishing, and being that strange thing called an authorpreneur. And I'm very pleased to have a guest on the ebook Revolution today, somebody who is perhaps the epitome of an authorpreneur. Her name is Joanne Penn. Joanna Penn, sorry. She's a New York Times and US Today best-selling author of thrillers and non-fiction. She's also a professional speaker and entrepreneur. Voted as one of the Guardian UK Top 100 Creative Professionals for 2013. And her website, thecreativepen.com, is regularly voted one of the top 10 sites for writers. And I'm very honoured to have her on the line today. Welcome, Joanne. Thanks for having me, Jeff. It's great to be on the show. It's a it's a great honour. Now you you lived down here in Australia for a while. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, sure. Well, I actually lived in New Zealand for seven years. I went backpacking in the year two thousand and stayed seven years, and then uh, met my husband and we moved to Brisbane. Uh, so I travelled around Australia quite a lot in in the early two thousands, and then lived there for four years. And actually, I started writing properly in in Australia. Um, and I do credit Australia for being responsible, um, partially, I think, for my blogging and my uh, indie publishing. Because I think if I'd have stayed in Britain I would have been kind of hamstrung by the traditional publishing route whereas Australians are very much a sort of you know get on with it you know as our Kiwis and I also got into the kind of Australian blogging scene um, Darren Rouse at Pro Blogger and Yaro Starak um, at Entrepreneur's Journey and so I really learned to be a kind of online entrepreneur while I lived in Australia and I wrote my my first novels there so uh, yeah and I, I will no doubt be coming back as well. Uh, so it, I, I kind of feel like it's where I started my author entrepreneur journey. You're, you're a big one for research. Have you, have you got any stories tucked away that um, may, may use that experience at some point? Uh, well, funny you should say that because uh, I wrote a book last year, um, co-written with a, a horror writer called Jay Thorne, and it's called Risen Gods, and it's a sort of post-apocalyptic uh, book set in New Zealand. And as soon as we wrote that, and it's you know sort of volcanoes and Maori gods and all kinds of things, and I did say to him, you know, we should do one about Australia, and uh, you know it would have to be sort of burned gods, <laughs> given the <laughs> given the bushfires or something. But no, I I haven't yet set a uh, uh, a thriller in Australia, I'm sure it will happen. But my next book uh, is set in India. So, you know, I do tend to use places I've been to um, in my books. I suppose you, your blog, you write about your um, love of travel. So I suppose that's always giving you some right material to, to feed back into your fiction. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, I was, you know, I try and um, book trips so my husband will have a good time, but they also feed into the book. So uh, we did a long weekend in Budapest one year. And uh, out of that, I wrote One Day in Budapest. And it's basically, you know, sort of a kick ass action adventure around the city and uh, directly written from that weekend. And this next book, Destroyer of Worlds, is sort of based on a couple of trips I've done in India. And I, I think writers, you know, for writers, it's good. You have to. To keep filling that creative well and I you know when people say to me oh I'm I'm blocked uh, I say well go and fill yourself up because you can't write unless you're filled up in some way so however, however you do that research it, it has to be done and uh, for me that involves traveling places and and seeing uh, you know different things. Now your first book um, Stone of Fire which started the whole Arcane series and your self-publishing journey I'm interested in the story about that. Could you elaborate on that for our listeners? As in how I self-published it or how I wrote it? or um, The inspiration for it. Uh, okay, well, St well, Stone of Fire, it opens in Varanasi, actually, in India, is the, um, where I travelled in 2006. And what's so funny is I actually found a diary of mine from 2004, um, a while back, and I've got a lot of journals. And I found this these notes I'd written uh, with an idea that um, when Jesus rose from the dead, and I'm, I have a master's degree in theology from Oxford, so I, I use a lot of theology in my books. Um, so when Jesus rose from 
the dead he, his apostles took rocks from the from the tomb um, and wore them you know broke it up and wore them as sort of stone pendants around their their necks and that these stones were sort of empowered at Pentecost with a supernatural power and uh, and then these stones were passed down uh, through the generations uh, based on where the bodies of the apostles are held and of course again uh, you know having been to Jerusalem and Spain and all these different places um, there are still bones and relics of the apostles or you know who people think of the apostles and so I sort of um, the idea for it came all the way back really to this degree I'd done you know uh, at Oxford all those years ago and then uh, just an idea I'd had and um, for me I think just I, I keep lists all the time of things of ideas and you know what if scenarios and these things tend to um, re-emerge uh, out of the subconscious when you sit down to write and I tend to write the book that is the one that's uh, most interesting to me at the time and I knew I wanted to write a series so the arcane it was always going to be the first of of the arcane series and uh, you know it's about a supernatural agency who solve these mysteries around the world so yeah I guess the idea came from my original research back in the 90s and then this trip in in 2006. I suppose it goes back to a to a uh, comp common suggestion to most writers to write about what you know in, in, in your instance well in one way but um, I, I tend to kill people in kind of ritual <laughs> ways and blow things up and so I, I think you I think you it's don't more do that for real well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> I think it's more right what you're interested in um, you know so for example with Destroyer of Worlds I, I've been learning all about Hinduism and Hindu gods and Kali the you know goddess of death and all kinds of cool things and and, um, and also uh, nuclear power and the Mahaparata and Indian myth. And, you know, so what I'm, whatever I'm interested in is what I tend to write about. Um, and so I, I would say that to people, follow your curiosity and you will never be bored with your writing. Well, certainly never bored reading uh, your wonderful books. I've just started on the first one and I can't put it down. And I will, <laughs> oh, be, thank you. I will be progressing <laughs> to the rest of the series. The, the books are beautifully researched. What, what's your approach to research and what advice would you give to a, a new writer setting out on this path? Yeah, so I must say that you don't have to go to all these places to write your books. Um, for me, I tend to start, you know, obviously if you're starting with a series, you do need series characters and a kind of... Um, uh, a bigger idea so the kind of secret agency idea is something that a lot of people use and as long as you have original characters and they're doing original things then that's quite a good a good way to do fiction uh, so I then essentially I will you know the idea that is that I'm fixating on say Destroyer of Worlds again which is about India um, it was it started off with this um, statue of Shiva Nataraja that I saw in a museum in Delhi and Shiva Nataraja um, had the dance you know the dance of time um and when shiva dances the universe is destroyed and then recreated so this was the idea that that um that shiva would be the start so when and literally i will just google uh into these different things so i would start with you know googling shiva nataraja what what does that actually mean what does the worship of shiva mean what are the places that are sacred to um the worship of shiva uh and then sort of from there just follow my curiosity down through the internet so you can definitely well i, I can't believe people used to write novels from the library because it just seems crazy whereas now you can just fall down these rabbit holes um i watch a lot of documentaries so i watched uh ganges which is a really great um documentary series obviously about the ganges um and a lot of documentaries about india and uh i normally read you know four or five books as well about the history of places because all my thrillers are sort of 95 percent based on reality and then i just twist it so it's not necessarily uh real <laughs> obviously it's fiction um but i twist it at the kind of last moment so i want it to be as believable as possible um so i use scrivener software which is fantastic and i just keep all my research in scrivener 
scrivener and then what I usually do will also be you know sort of have some idea around the beginning and the end so I did know that my opening would be in London where the arcane base is and that there would be a bomb dropped on Trafalgar Square and that something would be stolen from the vaults um, and that was that is the the statue now that's not a spoiler that's in the first scene <laughs> um, but then also what was so interesting is I um, discovered the quote that Oppenheimer said at the first uh, US atomic bomb test oh, yes. um, which is I am become death destroyer of worlds yeah. and he was actually referring to that Shiva Nataraja sculpture and there's also one of these sculptures at Kern which is where you know they're looking into the Big Bang so when you look at these things all together it's very easy to kind of wind a conspiracy theory around that type of thing um, so again it's sort of the main thing is following your curiosity then going down the rabbit hole on the internet and then bringing it back to your story and using a tool like Scrivener to structure your research into something coherent and the last thing I would say is it's really important not to get lost in research so some people will say oh you know I've been researching for two years that's silly <laughs> the best thing to do is to research enough to get started and then research what else you need along the way otherwise you'll you know you might as well just write a non-fiction book about whatever else you're researching and of course I write non-fiction as well but um there's slightly less imagination involved in that just uh I'm just struck by your your <laughs> the whole idea the um the google rabbit hole and think thinking um my time in university just researching books in a library like old, old school and and you'd you'd ma always make that serendipitous discovery wouldn't you so you'd you go through the catalogue and you'd find something on a shelf and mm. then, then you'd look around and on the shelf below there'd be the very book you're looking for that you would not have perhaps researched in the first time. Do you think that Google has taken that away, that, that, that chance of serendipitous discovery? In research. Oh, not, not at all. I think it's doubly, triply amazing now. Um, for example, um, I use Flickr. Um, and YouTube and what's so interesting now is the number of average Joes who are uploading their photos and their thoughts on blogs and on videos uh, you know so for example I was looking at uh, a place called the Ellora Caves in India and I found this brilliant video and it was just literally some Indian tourist who had walked around the Ellora Caves with his uh, iPhone and it was a terrible amateur video it really was but it was brilliant for my scene because all I need to do is just write what I see and that is very hard to get from a book it's brilliant to get people's videos and Flickr again is full of and Pinterest actually uh, although Pinterest is a bit more professional Flickr is full of people's holiday photos and I have um, there was one particular scene in Stone of Fire where I was writing uh, about Iran and I haven't been to Iran I, I really would lo lo love to go um, and I wanted to write about this particular um, market in um, in Shiraz and I actually you know again I went on Flickr and found a, a tourist's photos from this place in Iran so I actually think the serendipity of the internet is even better than the library because of course the library only had books from a certain class of people in the old days people who could afford to write a book or people who'd been paid to write a book so now we have you know more average people who are putting content online um, Instagram would be another example where you can find things that will help you and will make your books so much more real and, and another just one more example because I, I just love this stuff um um, you know this book about India I was trying to remember what was the name of this really good street snack that I had so I could put it in the book and make it you know come alive with the smell of food and um, you know you just google top uh, street food in Mumbai and you get a whole load of bloggers who you know have written these posts about street food now that would be very hard to find in a um, in a in a, a library for example yeah, um, I stand corrected. I've, I've never considered using personal blogs or, or Flickr in, in that way, and it certainly cuts down on the frequent flyer points. 
I guess. <laughs> well, it's good to do both, but you can't always go everywhere. And as you go down these rabbit holes, you know, you have to, although the, like there's one example that the Towers of Silence, which are a Zoroastrian um, burial ground, uh, these places are prohibited to, you know, people who are not of the faith. So how else can I write about it unless it's through uh, what people have blogged and, um, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, it's just another another form of research. And um, what, what, what's your view on the importance of writers keeping diaries as part of that research? Like a- um, I think it would depend on what you know, what type of book they were writing. I mean, I tend to, when I travel, I do write a journal. Um, you know, I will write just, and, and in fact, for the India book, I did go back and, and you know, read, I, I dictated that book. I wrote it with dictation. So I actually read some of my diary into the chapters. Um, so there is that, that my own feeling is in there. But I also like to just kind of soak things up and let my mind come up with things later on and I do take a lot of pictures um, and I use Flickr so I put my pictures up on Flickr and Pinterest and things like that in the hope that it will help other people so I think however you experience life um, you know how you take it in doesn't matter so much as just saying yes to things that emerge from your brain so I actually have a sign on my wall here I have a number of signs but one of them says trust emergence uh, because when you know like I just finished this book the other day and there's that feeling after you finish a book of oh I'll never write again because my brain is completely empty I've just emptied myself into this book Mm. that's why I have trust emergence on my wall because I know that given a bit of time and space and relaxation these things will bubble up from my mind again things that I didn't even realize that I remembered so Yes, I agree with kind of active remembering, but also trust emergence that something will emerge if you give it the space and you sit down to write. That's a great philosophy. De- Destroyer of Worlds, of course, is the, the latest. And um, do, do you have a release date on that yet? Uh, April 21st. Fan- it's, on, fan- it's on pre-order, so that is, uh, that is on its way. 2016, <laughs> depending on when people are listening. <laughs> fan- fantastic. And do you think um, more arcane books will bubble up from this process into the future? or? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, I always just, I always wanted it to be an ongoing series. And, you know, given that your your show is for authorpreneurs, um, most fiction authors who make any money have a series. So if you want to make um, income from fiction, and it is a great income stream once you have a number of books, then writing a series is really important. And my Arcane series is kind of episodic. So there are main characters um, who I I'm not killing off <laughs> and although there are lots of characters I do kill off um, but each time there's a new mystery and then they have to go and solve it Morgan and Jake have to go and solve this mystery wherever they are in the world so my aim is to keep that going as my sort of pillar series um, and then for example I have the London crime thriller trilogy and that that is is a trilogy it closes a circle although each book can be read on its own it's it still is a kind of a trilogy and then i have uh standalone books as well so i think the there will definitely be more arcane but the next book i the no, next fiction i'll write is going to be uh probably a standalone or potentially a trilogy and i'm actually off to edinburgh next weekend to start the research on that and the bubbling process will start again Exactly. <laughs> you, Joanna, you certainly love dark thrillers as a genre. Who are, your, who are the writers that inspire you in that area? Well, my favourite book is Stephen King's The Stand, uh, oh, which yes. is mine, mine a sort well. of, yeah, it's an Under, amazing underrated. book. Very underrated. Sorry. It's a very underrated book, I think. Do you think because so many of the people in my niche, it's everyone's favourite book? I think there's a certain uh, group of people to who you know to whom it is um, that one in the Dark Tower. You know, people who write dark fantasy, who write the slightly supernatural. Um, Stephen King is is our god, basically. <laughs> so um, yeah, very much Stephen King. And then uh, when I was in Australia, a big in- influence on my writing is Matthew Riley, who's a who's an Australian who actually oh, yeah. self published way before 
before um, it became, you know, ebook related. Um, Matthew is fantastic, and uh, his kind of action adventure books in, inspired me, as did James Rollins. And um, I have tons of, I, I read an awful lot. Um, but I think what was a big deal for me, and again, I hope this helps your listeners, is to trust what you love. And, you know, so some of my books are pretty dark. Um, my London crime thriller series, starting with Desecration, is super dark, <laughs> um, has an, a real edge of, of horror. And, uh, you know, that book, that's when I learned not to self-censor, to actually write the things that were quite disturbing in my own head. But actually, when you put yourself out there in that more honest way, readers resonate with your writing a lot more. So by not self-censoring and not being a, a good girl or a good boy, um, you know, actually writing what what's in your weird little head, um, then you, you resonate more with readers because everyone is a bit weird. It's just writers <laughs> actually tap into that and will actually put it on the page for other people to experience. And certainly Stephen King's the master of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think trusting that there is a market for whatever you enjoy. Like, I I mean, we know that romance is the biggest genre, but I don't write romance. I mean, I have sexual tension in my books, but uh, there's no happy ever after. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe hereafter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Joanna, you're, you're the very model of um, what we call the authorpreneur, um, writer, entrepreneur. You write fiction under your non diplume JF Penn, of course, um, which we've been discussing. And you also write a lot, lot of non fiction books about the business of independent publishing. You also teach writing through your online courses and you're a sought after public speaker. And I'm just exhausted <laughs> reading through that <laughs> list. Um, tell me about your aha moment when you realised an indie writer really needed to embrace, um, diversify, I suppose. Yeah, so I think it comes down to what people want. So I, when I was living in Australia, I was really uh, miserable in my job. I was working in the mining industry and uh, which of course is is a big employer in Australia mm, and I was actually so working in the in the <laughs> accounts department um, implementing financial systems and this is this is one of the least creative jobs possible <laughs> um, and so I wanted to change my life and I started listening to a lot of self-help and I decided to write a book which was my first non-fiction book uh, still available as career change which I, I rewrote a few years ago but when I decided what I wanted I realized that I wanted to live a a free life so um the, there's a Tony Robbins exercise that he does in one of his books I can't remember which one but it's essentially what is the value what is the one word that describes the value by which you want to live your life and that is a very mm. hard exercise <laughs> but yes. if you do it it will really help you and my word is freedom so when I thought about what freedom meant, it meant a, an income that was not related to hours of me being in an, in an office subject to somebody else's whim. Uh, and then along with a lot of people in 2008, I got laid off. Um, so, you know, it was a the global financial crisis and I decided I did not want to have somebody just destroy all my income with one bit of paper. You know, it's just like, bye bye, that's it. So all of these things for me, me kind of crystallized into all right so what I want to do with my life is is write and create books and travel and uh you know earn really good money so I can do this um, in comfort I didn't want to be a backpacker anymore I am 41 um so that's when I kind of started to look at, all right, so if I want to have a, a free life where I can be location independent, where I can be financially free and not have to be reliant on one company, what do I need to do to do that? And um, that's why I have these various income streams, because I was never going to allow one stream of income to to basically destroy my life. This is why I'm also not into KDP Select, which is Amazon's uh, exclusive program, because I don't believe in letting one company <laughs> control all my income. So I'm very much focused on growing my business through Kobo and iBooks and all the other things. So 
that would be the, the first thing to challenge people with is what is that one word and do you really want to be a full-time author entrepreneur and then if you do then it's understanding that each book is not just one product but it is multiple products so it's an ebook which you can sell on multiple platforms it's a print book it's an audio book and then you can sell that in lots of different countries so I've sold books in 74 countries it can be a screenplay it can be a graphic novel it can be a multimedia course so it's really then turning each book into multiple streams of income and uh, yeah when when the penny dropped on that it really changed my life and it took me three and a half years to be able to leave my job in the mining industry and uh, do this full time just a phenomenal story uh, as you've said your books are available in multiple languages and also as audio books and, and your output's pretty exceptional and for a new writer embarking on the indie path <laughs> possibly a bit daunting uh, <laughs> as, as it didn't start that way <laughs> you've got to remember that <laughs> that's it but um i'm fascinated what's the secret behind your phenomenal productivity um well i'm very driven <laughs> so when i made that decision that i wanted to to make a full-time living with my writing i really focused on it so i actually went down to four days uh, a week at work so this is you know talking back in 2011 um, 2010, 2011, uh, I went down to four days and, oh no, before that would have been 2008. Um, and so I was basically giving up 20% of my income for an extra day. And then I would get up before work at 5am and write and I would come home and I would, you know, because being in Australia is quite good in terms of the time zone for America. So in the evening I would do podcasting and blogging and social media and I was learning the business of online business, <laughs> essentially, um, while I was still working. And um, it took, I mean, that first, the first non-fiction book took me over a year. My first novel took me 14 months uh, while I was, you know, and I'm still learning. I'm still taking courses. I, uh, this is a, a job you never stop learning in. Um, but in terms of my productivity now, things speed up when you know how the process works. So once you know how to write a story, once you understand story structure, uh, and I would recommend people read uh, The Story Grid by Sean Coyne, C-O-Y-N-E, uh, if you're interested in writing a novel, um, you know, things like getting Scrivener sorted out, things like learning how to use dictation to make your writing faster, things like um, getting over the first draft issue and realising that you need an editor. You know, all these processes are something you have to learn through experience. And once you do, then you have to move on to learning the next thing. But the reason I'm so productive now I think is because I know my process I have all my professionals in place so I work with about 11 contractors um uh, you know like I have a cover designer I have my editor I have graphic designers I you know I have my accountant and my bookkeeper and so I have my business processes sorted out and again uh, you know I've been running this business for seven years now so if you talk to anyone who's been running any business for seven years they should have their processes sorted out if you're just at the beginning then you won't have that it's just something that develops over time I, I will just add that I do have um, a book that's only a couple of dollars it's called how to make a living with your writing and I go into a lot of detail in that book about how I how I do just that. And uh, I'd highly recommend that to any of our listeners. I was just interested there. Um, you was, I just took a note. <laughs> you were saying your first <laughs> novel took uh, 14 months to write. Has that got any, any quicker with the, with the most recent novel, Destroyer of Worlds? Imagine yep. That. <laughs> it was I spent about a month well a month on and off over Christmas you know so I started researching uh, the end of December uh, although of course a lot of these ideas are kind of bubbling away um, but I started writing 5th of January I finished the first draft on the 1st of February so it was only a month uh, to do 65,000 words which is the length of my novels and James Patterson novels. It's a kind of thriller length book. Um, and that was based on dictation. So it's something I've um, 
sorted out this year. It's been on my list for ages and I use uh, Dragon Dictate and I speak my books now. So that actually really increased my word count per session and I dictate into Scrivener. And then um, February I spent editing and we're recording this on the last day of February and uh, Destroyer of Worlds went to my editor last week so essentially uh, I have my process for writing and editing and then it goes to my editor and then comes back and I do another round and then it goes to my proofreader but I would say that it when you have an established series you have your characters you have your world you actually have the uh, structure already sorted out so you know that I I know the beats of an arcane thriller so then I just need to fill in the scenes with the interesting stuff that happens along the way um, and so it's it is much easier to write a novel in an existing series um, and the next book I'll be writing will be on mindset for authors which which is a non-fiction and that may take longer because I'm doing a lot of research around psychology um, no, it probably won't take longer. It'll probably also take two months to do. Um, and that's my process for books that I kind of understand. Um, and then this next thing that I'm doing, I don't know how long that will take, but my aim is now to try and get that first draft out as fast as possible. And if you're writing a couple of thousand words a day, um, if you're writing a 65,000 word novel in a month, that is two and a half thousand words a day. So that's for someone who is a professional full-time writer, <laughs> that's not that big a deal. <laughs> do, do the arcane books get more fun to write each time you write them? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. I, I went out with some literary fiction writers the other week and uh, I was just like, you guys take yourself so seriously. Uh, you know, why not have some fun with your books? And actually, one of the reasons I write the books I do, the reason I write escapist thrillers with kind of explosions and chases and, you know, they're like action movies, um, although they have a, a deeper side. But mainly the whole point is that you can escape for a bit. And that's because when I was working in the mining industry and commuting like many people do and in Australia you know the commute can be quite long um, I was reading thrillers and I was at my lunch hour I was going to get sushi and I was reading thrillers so when I decided what to what I was going to write it was going it was always going to be something that could be escapist for people who hate their jobs and um, so the arcane is kind of Dan Brown meets Lara Croft uh, in that kind of action adventure way so yeah I think people should write what they love and there's such a snobby attitude around what is a the right book to oh, be yes. writing yeah. but it's crazy because if you compare the success of 50 shades of gray uh which you know made el james 95 million dollars <laughs> in a year um to the latest pulitzer prize winning book or booker prize winning book or you know the stuff you have in australia those books sell barely anything because people don't actually want to read those books <laughs> The books people want to read are the romance ones or the thrillers or, you know, the sci-fi books, the genre fiction that takes them out of their life for a few hours. You're quite right. And there's certainly a culture in Australia of um, revering and worshipping um, literary writers at the expense of, you know, people like um, Bryce Courtney and, mm. and, and Matthew who write great escapist fiction, but, you know, hey, they haven't been nominated for a booker. <laughs> but, mean, but they're multimillionaires. And, yeah. that, and I think that's really important, is that people decide what they want to achieve. Um, you know, I, I went to Oxford. My mum was an English teacher. I could write literary fiction if I wanted to. And I do write the best books I can. You know, they are well written. But yeah, the point indeed. is the story. You need a good story. And I would rather be like Stephen King and well loved, you know, one of the most loved and one of the richest authors in the world. <laughs> then I, I would much rather be that than win uh, a literary prize. But I do know authors who would rather win a literary prize. And I think at the end of the day, everybody needs to decide what their aim is. And if you want to win a literary prize, then you're better off uh, doing an MFA in creative writing, meeting the right people and being traditionally published. Whereas if you want to make seven figures, you're probably better off going indie. 
I'm much happier reading um, page turners that just want to make me take me out. What happens next? I mean, my fa- mm. I'm my favourite. I'm a fa- fan of crime fiction. I just love Lee Child. I mean, I can't get mm. enough of him. He's um, a brilliant. Yeah, Lee's great. I really writer. like the Jack Reacher books too. So, if you knew what you knew now about creating indie success as a writer, what would you tell your younger self? If you could uh, pop back in the TARDIS. <laughs> well, the <laughs> so. thing is, when I started, uh, you know, with that first book in 2006, 2007, there was no Kindle. It was before the Kindle. It was before print on demand. So I made all the mistakes that people don't have to make now. You know, I, I actually printed several thousand books and tried to hand sell them, which you just don't need to do anymore. You just use print on mm. demand. Yeah. And there was no Kindle. So, you know, you couldn't make such a big profit. So I think, going back now it would be very difficult I I mean I would love to say to myself look at how far things will change things will massively change and this is why I'm so um uh, you know I, I hammer on on my podcast about the global growth of digital because if you wind the clock back five years um in the UK um in Australia even in America this stuff just wasn't happening and people weren't reading on their cell phones on the commute on the train people weren't reading on a kindle device you know people were still reading newspapers for goodness sake and look what's happened to those so this is so much has changed in five years and so much is going to change in the next five years and to me that's what we need to look at it you know it's things are never going to stay the same and what you need to do is be agile and be ready um and i think i i mean i've pretty much taken advantage of any changes and i keep my eye on the future but i i would probably go back and tell myself uh you know just keep going things are gonna uh, really change and uh, just jump on anything you can do you think traditional publishers are, are struggling with this new world Oh, not at all. (laughs) I mean, what's so funny is how many authors still want a traditional publisher. And I think what's happened now is it used to be vanity to self-publish. It used to be called vanity publishing. Nowadays, to me, the biggest vanity is wanting a publisher because, you know, the reason you want a publisher is for someone to tell you your book is good. Um, Whereas indies, just we just publish our book and readers will tell us if it is any good. (laughs) And that's more important. So I think traditional publishers are not going to uh, are not having an issue there's still plenty of authors who are um you know pitching them i don't think they're they're having any issue they're also recruiting the indie authors who do well and then want to stop doing the rest of the job and i think this is the point is when you are successful creative you and you you're an indie author and you're an entrepreneur you have to do all these other jobs so even though i have a book formatter and a cover designer i still have to manage all of those those processes i still like today just before we started talking i was updating a cover now because i publish on a whole load of different platforms i have to log into amazon change the cover change this word here there and everywhere maybe update the back matter on the book and then go on to ibooks and then kobo and then draft to digital and you know and then my website and all these jobs that will take a couple of hours for me today or quite technical work, a lot of authors do not want to do that. Uh, a lot of authors don't want to be an authorpreneur. <laughs> so I think that the world is kind of separating into creatives. And this is true for musicians, for artists, um, you know, chefs, you know, it, it's it's changing into a world where people who are willing and you know, want to learn Mm, to run a business will do that. And then people who want to give control up and, you know, basically have someone do it for them in exchange for 90% of the income, um, then they will do that too. So I think it's more of a personality thing than anything else. Yes, I think we're all control freaks. (laughs) Oh, definitely. (laughs) And speed freaks. You know, this is why um, when I wrote that first book and I was in Australia, I'd never even considered uh, what happened in the publishing industry. And I went along to the Sydney Writers Festival Mm. to one of these talks where they tell you what publishing really means. And I was appalled that it would take potentially two years, three years before my book was on the shelf. And I just went, no way. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) 
Of course, you, you've built quite an extensive writer's platform yourself, and we talk t- touched on platform there. What, what's your advice for new writers setting out to build a platform that, you, you know, they, they might find this whole process a bit bit daunting? H- how would you simply describe a platform and, and going about constructing one? Well, I think, again, you have to decide what you want. So, for example, if you want to be Stephen King and you want to be a fiction writer, that's the thing you want to do, then all you need is a kind of static website. So people are going to have a look at my site, jfpen.com, which is the name I write fiction under. um, And that site is essentially quite a static website in that it has book pages, it has some articles. It does say it has a blog, but it it is very infrequent and it doesn't have dates on, for example. Um, So if you're writing fiction, you don't need to podcast and blog and uh, you need one kind of social media so you can interact with people. But your main marketing for fiction is more books. So your effort should go into books and your platform is your email list and, you know, having a free book, for example, and, you know, and things like BookBub and promotions like that. So for fiction, it's very different. For nonfiction, uh, it is, you know, then things like podcasting, blogging, all of that different, you know, YouTube, for example, makes sense because people are looking for advice. That's one of the reasons they'd be listening to your show or my podcast, for example. So, but, but you know, the funny thing is I didn't set out to become a someone who was an expert in self-publishing it's just that when I got ripped off back in 2008 I wanted to help other people avoid getting ripped off so I started the creative pen as a way to kind of document that journey and it's just turned into what it's turned into (laughs) Um, so I would say you know if you're starting a platform let's say you're writing a non-fiction book on um, you know vegan cooking then your platform is going to be recipes on vegan cooking videos on vegan cooking you know you could have a podcast and interview vegans uh you know you'll be writing uh articles about different aspects of being vegan you know realistically becoming an expert in your niche so i've ended up being an expert in this self-publishing niche um but typically a non-fiction author would be an expert in a, a different niche niche so like their health would be a niche. So that, in terms of my main advice, it's deciding where you want to be in five years' time. Again, this kind of five-year thing. If you want to be a well-known fiction author, write fiction. If you want to be a well-known non-fiction author, you know, start a podcast is is a good thing these days. Um, you know, have a website that has keyword specific stuff on learn content marketing get on social media network with other influencers and uh you know get to know people go to events that type of thing so a platform for non-fiction can be you know youtube twitter your email list your podcast your blog it's much more extensive and most non-fiction authors make more money from the back end uh, in inverted commons which will be courses speaking consulting those types of things and the book will offer and just be a lead gen or like a business card whereas um for fiction most fiction authors will write a lot of books and their money will come from fiction so don't do what i do (laughs) which is split myself 50 50 into these two different brands (laughs) unless you really want to Um, it is very difficult to maintain two separate brands two separate businesses essentially and my income is split 50 50 um but my aim in the next five years is really to to transition, you know, more into fiction over time. Well, that's probably a great place to wrap it up. I want to thank you again to for the time you've uh, spent on the ebook revolution today. What would you say Joanna Penn's philosophy of success is? Uh, again, on my wall, it says, "Have you made art today?" And I look at that every day and that is my goal. Uh, so that that is really my philosophy. Have I made art? And once I have, am I putting that in the world? And of course, art can be whatever you decide it 
means <laughs> but I need to put something new out in the world every day and the thing is once you start doing that it kind of snowballs you get more ideas you you know you, you lean into your creativity lots of different things start happening so that just you know being proactive making art putting it out there that's that's probably my philosophy and I, I hope that people listening will go out and make some art today that's a great philosophy. And thank you again, Joanna. And people listening, uh, Joanna's new book, Destroyer of Worlds, the Eighth and the Arcane series, is out as April 21st. Yes, yeah. uh, but for writers, uh, my website is thecreativepen.com, pen with a double N, and there's a free author blueprint and the podcast and uh, all kinds of things. Or you can ask me questions on Twitter at thecreativepen fantastic and that the creative pen is a, a great resource if if you haven't visited before i highly recommend it joanna thank you again for your time today thanks so much for having me jeff and of course all the show notes will be over on madhousemedia.com.au just uh, go to podcast and i believe we're on episode 15 with um joanna pen and it, what a fantastic guest joanna has been this morning and again um uh, go over to the creativepen.com. That's P E W N. And um, it, it's just an incredible resource. Uh, Joanna is so generous with her knowledge and what she knows, and she is a great teacher and she is a great writer and inspiration. That's it for me on the ebook revolution. It's, it's been a, a great morning, great interview. Um, Please uh, pop over to iTunes and put a little review in there because reviews are the lifeblood of uh, iTunes podcasts. And the more people that rate and review the show, the more the message gets out and the more people listen. And um, that helps helps me carry this along. So, yeah, it's on iTunes. Give us a review. We're also on the Stitcher Network. So that's it for me today, Jeff Hughes. You've been listening to the ebook Revolution. See you next time. <laughs>